Oh, we're not recording this thing, are we? <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to say. I played the fifth. <laughs> This is Mark Middleberg. I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I'm an evangelist, and I love Christ. And I got to tell you, you are listening to Wild Man and Steve. You are about to listen to the intersection of faith, talk, and music. The Wild Man and Steve show starts right now. All right, so Steve. So go ahead. Go ahead. You, you you told me you knew exactly how to open the show tonight, so go right ahead. I do, I do. I know exactly how to open the show. Welcome, folks, to the Steve and Wildman show. Yeah, you're you're really stuck on that, aren't you? You're <laughs> I can't, you, can't, you know. Can't let that yeah. Go ahead. Look a little I've, I've been playing Robin to your Batman for like the last couple of years. I, I'm, I'm the second fiddle. I'm the second banana. Okay, but let, let me ask you a question. Though. Let me ask you a question. The first uh, time we had this show, who was the guest and who was the host? Okay, you're going to bring that up again, the fact that I was the guest the first time on the, on the show. You're going to bring that up again? Yeah, you were really? the guest. Really? Wait, I know I was, I, I was there. I was the guest. I know. Yeah, ever, ever since then, I tell you, my ratings just went down just ever since I had... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. I do not know why I continue to do this show with you. Because oh, it's so much fun. I enjoy it. You know. Okay, you know what? That's it. I enjoy it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, rate that opening if you can uh, at Wild Man and Steve. Hashtag Wild Man and Steve. Um, rate that opening as we're going with all the openings that we've done. And that one was, what would you classify that one as, Steve? A five, six, seven... Oh, I, th- I I think that's definitely like a you know a, a, a four point eight. <laughs> four point eight. <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to uh, turn. This is the part of the program that all of our guests, all, all of our followers, everybody understands that this is when we turn it over to Mister Segway. And before we go to that direction, Steve, before we go to that segment, question yes. for you. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there is no other podcast. No other radio show in the history of radio, probably no other TV broadcast, probably no entertainment broadcast at all that has ever had someone on the show known as Mr. Segway. Well, I think that's right. I I think we are unique in that. I think we uh, we're blazing the trail uh, in that regard. And uh, I just want to say, can can I start out, Wild Man? I I apologize for earlier in in the opening there. if if I cause any sort of, of, of bad blood between us, I, I really I want to apologize for that right now. And I would just like to get back some some, some good blood between us. Can, can, can we do that? So, 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 some good blood. Good, good blood. Yeah. Can we just get back to good blood? Good blood. <laughs> yeah. So if you say that a couple of times, you know, you have good blood, good blood, good blood, 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 good. Exactly. Right. Yeah, right. That's what, I'm, yeah, right. that's what I'm hoping for. Right. 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 You know, Mr. Segway, he, ladies and gentlemen, he strikes again because Mr. Segway, would you believe tonight on the show, we have Michael Bloodgood himself with us. Would you? Are you that? serious? Yes, I am absolutely serious. You struck it again. You just always know how to say the right things. Unbelievable. So, Michael, welcome to the program. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. That was quite the segue. <laughs> Man, that took a long time. I started thinking, you know, what the heck is going on here? What are they doing? Yeah. Boy, yeah, we we're, we're, glad, we're glad you stayed with us. We're glad yeah. you stayed with us. Oh, good. Yeah, we, we never we, we haven't had a guest leave during the opening yet, but uh, we know that may happen at some point. So, so we want to appreciate the fact that you're gracious enough to still be with us. So 
Michael, um, something that um, our listeners are always interested in, if you could take us back to your first time you started playing music, uh, whatever instrument that was, I'm assuming it was the bass at some point, but uh, what was your first involvement with music? Well, I'm of the age where I saw in 1964 the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, and I saw the Screaming Girls, and my brother and I looked at each other and said, that's what we want to do. So that's kind of started. I was about 10 or 11 years old, I think, then. I saved up a couple of bucks. I went out and bought a really cheap Stella acoustic guitar, a three-quarter scale pile of junk, makes your fingers bleed. But some reason, I just I kind of just stuck with it. So that that became my, my ill-fated, well, I know it's ill-fated, but that became my music career, so to speak, when I was a little kid. So I wow. stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can we just acknowledge right now on this show that probably the reason why guys do, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say nine out of 10 things that they do is because girls are involved. You mentioned the screaming girl on the Sullivan show and, and, you know, wow, man, we've talked about our, our rock locks back in the day. And, and seriously, that is the reason I grew my hair out. When I was in college, I, I read something in the student newspaper, went to Indiana University, said that, that chicks dug guys with long hair. And I kid you not, that was the last haircut I got, uh, simply because <laughs> that's what I read. I mean, you know, so, so absolutely. I mean, we're, guys, it doesn't matter. We're, that, that's how we're motivated. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, when I was in, in high school, you know, they still had a hair regulation. So we all started wearing wigs to call it to school. To, so, you know, so it was just crazy. But I mean, it was all in fact the, the whole athletic programs went down the toilet because you had to shave your head to play <laughs> sports. And so all the coaches, boy, boy, I go, boy, you change the rules. Maybe I come out and play football or something for you. But so everything just kind of plummeted because it was all rock and roll. Everybody I knew had a, a bass, a guitar, a drum, you know, a set of drums or a keyboard or something because we all were trying to play rock and roll. So I just, that's the generation that grew up in. The cross changes everything. What I'm going to be Your grace Your grace gave me eyes to see God, I fall down on my knees Jesus, I call on you And it's your love that answers me So what was your first experience on stage? Wow. Let me think about that one for a second. Uh, musically speaking, you know, because I've also was into drama quite a bit in junior high and high school. But musically speaking, uh, it was probably uh, my band called the 13th Dynasty. We started playing some talent shows when we were kids. It's like a five or six piece band. And we're just doing whatever top 40 we could at that point. So that was probably my first my first stage experience that I can recall anyway was playing with these guys. So it was a load of fun. And in fact, all the guys, to my knowledge, that were in that band, and this is junior high school, are still playing today, which is really exciting. Oh, wow. I, just, I just went to my class reunion, you know, and all the guys that were playing are still playing. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Wow. That is cool. Now, yeah. you mentioned top 40 with that. And of course, you mentioned the Beatles earlier. So. Uh, think about to those early musical influences. Uh, was it really you know, Beatles, Top 40 kind of stuff? Uh, and or however you want to approach this, but you know, when did the, the harder rock and metal really start coming in as an influence for you? Yeah, I grew up, you know, with the Beatles and the Stones and, you know, Deep Purple was getting a little bit heavier and stuff like that. Um, uh, the metal thing di didn't really I mean, I always I always dug metal. I listened to it. It wasn't really my passion. Until the Lord put this band on my heart to start praying about it. And that's really where it came from. I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't born a heavy metal guy. In fact, you know, I'm in the generation again that it was music was music. Go look at Woodstock. You had 
Joan Baez and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young and 10 years after and The Who. And it was just, you know, we didn't we didn't segregate like it's segregated today. Right. But uh, so, you know, when I when I God just you know, gave me the vision for this heart for this ministry, I just started. OK, I, let me see. Check it out, because I, you know, I wasn't praying that I could do it. I was just praying that God would raise up a band or bands to uh, to bring the gospel to these kids, because I was working in a music store at that time, a, a guitar shop. And all my customers were in the metal. I mean, every one of them. And I said, there's nobody reaching these people, you know. So a friend of mine, another band, we just started praying that God would raise up that band. And the longer I prayed, the more I realized I think God was telling me to do it. I was, I was already involved in music ministry at that time. It wasn't anything I was looking forward to do or looking to do. And so uh, that's when I went to, a, I think it was Music Warehouse. I knew the manager there. And I says, give me your best metal. What, what's the best stuff you got? So she gave me you know, Maiden and Priest and all these guys. And I took it home and just started listening to it. And I just kind of fell in love with the genre right then and there because I thought, man, what a great mix to put Christian thoughts and values and Old Testament, you know, into into metal. I mean, I just to me, it was just like, oh, this is awesome. So that's kind of when I fell in love with, with metal at that point. Wow. I, I got to say, I think, and, and while, man, you know, back me up or, or, or refute this, but I think that may be the first time we've heard that approach I, and, and, and not in any way to, to, to knock or to denigrate uh, what other guests have said, but I, I think a lot of other guests have been motivated by the particular music that they enjoyed. Hey, I really like this. I like blues based rock. I like uh, metal or whatever. And I want to play that. But your comment, you saw a bunch of metal heads, metal kids, and it was really, how do we reach those kids? Yeah. And and praying for those kids, I, I'm, I'm I'm blown away by that. That that really that targeted evangelistic motivation. That that's actually what prompted the band. I think. Am, am I, a wild man? Am I correct about that? I don't think we've ever heard that before. Yeah, I think that is the first time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that was you know again my heart at the beginning of this thing was you know. I didn't have anything to do with it. I just wanted to pray that God would lift up a pen. A guy named Rick Stone, you know, he was a good friend of mine. We just started praying. And then as I started praying, the more I prayed, I mean, this this went on for like a year and a half. You know, then all of a sudden I guess, God, I think the Lord wants me to do it, you know. So I, I sought some counsel from Daryl Mansfield back in those mm. days. You know, Daryl and I have been good friends for a lot of years. And he just said, well, you need to pray about it. He says, you, need, you know, you need to start a whole new band and da, 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 da. And so I just, I just kind of just slowly but surely started, you know, checking out the scene and, you know, what was going on at that time. And, and that's how it came about for me. You know, now I'm a complete metalhead. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a latecomer, I guess. But, you know, I mean, if I was doing what I wanted to do, or not, not I wanted to do, but I would have just been doing Beatle covers or, you know, just a pop band or something like that. Uh, but the, I just got, I don't know, married to metal. And I've been that way ever since. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to throw this out there also. Somebody, I don't know if it's going to be you, Michael, or somebody has got to write a book called Married to Metal. And I don't know if that's going to be a book about all the, the, the uh, rock and roll metal wives and they're telling their stories. I don't know if it's about a music, musicians who are married to metal. But I don't know. That's such a great title, Married to Metal. I love that. <laughs> yeah, my wife and I were actually thinking about writing a book about our marriage. You know, I've been married for 46 years. And, uh, you know, we were thinking, well, you know, because we do tea and Bible every day, you know, so, hey, tea, Bible and the video or, or how rock and roll saved my marriage or something fun like that. So who knows? Maybe we'll get around to it. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. So when you look at the, uh, the Trenches of Rock um, documentary, um, that gives the behind the scenes look, which I appreciated of being able to see the challenges that you personally faced and the band Bloodgood faced. Um, mm -hmm. in the face of doing a metal ministry, uh, being metal missionaries. Um, what, can you talk to us about and uh, just let our listeners hear some of those um, times that it really became tough um, when you were trying to keep the band going in the midst of the controversy of what you were doing? Well, controversy just kind of surrounded the band. But when I was just throwing an idea around to some of my friends, you know, a lot of them just said, oh, you can't do that. You know, you can't play metal and all that. And I said, well, I don't know. Why not? It's just music. You know, it's 
like Daryl used to tell me, you know, your music is just a scalpel. You know, in the hand of a surgeon, it's brilliant. In the hand of a Charles Manson, it's horrible, you know. But it's just, it's it's nothing to itself. So I finally talked to my pastor and he said, dude, just go for it. You know, if you feel God's going to do it, then just the heck with everybody else. So that's kind of how it kind of started out sort of controversial. A couple of years later, we're in the midst of it. You know, we've got uh, protesters coming to our, you know, our shows and big huge cutouts of me saying I'm a homosexual and all that kind of stuff. So it just, you just, you have to, you have to know that God called you to do it in any ministry because there's always going to be those hurdles. In fact, if there, if there aren't any hurdles, you're probably not in the ministry or you're out of God's will. You know, you, you're going to come under attack. You know, your your Satan's got you on his list, which is a good place to be. But, you know, you got to stay on your knees to, to get forward. And so, you know, we just, we just, we knew, you know, I mean, when our, we blew a trend or a, a, a head or something like that. We went on our way to a show in Bluefield, West Virginia. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't have any money. We didn't know what we we're going to do. We had to, we took every penny we had to get the car towed or the truck towed to the, to the gig. And we did the gig and we had to stay in town. And these, you know, it was out of auto work coal miners and people whistling at us. And, you know, just, you know, it's just, it's awful. But then, you know, your, your pastor says, hey, we're with you guys. We'll help you guys out, you know, and money came in from the churches because we didn't have anything to go on. And so you just, you know, God always gave you enough encouragement to keep it going to the next show, basically. But it was yeah. always, it was always rough. And uh, we just got, I guess, we, I don't know if we got used to the roughness, but we just kind of came to expect it. And when, when it wasn't rough and somebody really treated us great or gave us a nice hotel room, man, we, do we appreciate it. <laughs> Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away Yeah. I, I want to circle back to something you said earlier. You talked about uh, when Wildman asked a question about when you were first on stage and you said, well, you mean musically because you, you'd had some drama experience. Obviously, the, the, the band Blood Good, one of the things people who, if you know the band, uh, know that you have such a, a visual aspect uh, to the stage show, obviously the dramatic uh, aspect. Uh, and, you know, when we talked with Les, uh, the first time that we had Les Carlson on, uh, we talked about his experience in musical theater, um, you know, being in the musical hair and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And we kind of think about him in that aspect. Uh, tell what did you bring in terms of the theatricality uh, and some of your drama experience to the Blood Good live show? Well, I mean, I was I was high school drama club president, you know, so I've always had it in my blood. You know, I did a lot of, you know, plays, to, you know, for four three, four years, whatever it was. So I've always, had, I've always had it in my blood. I've always loved theater. And so when Les came on, his theatrical experience, it was just kind of a, I don't know, just meant to be, you know. So we, when we were getting together to put that rock theater show together, we, we realized that we had these songs that kind of created these little vignettes, you know, whether it was, whether it was The Passion or Alone in Suicide. And, you know, we had these little stories that we were telling. And it's like, ah, if we put these two together and those four together, you know, we've got this thing. And so that kind of was a catalyst for us beginning to develop the rock theater show. And we just love, you know, bringing in people from a lot of them were from my church and uh, guest artists that were doing the makeup for us and the special effects and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I guess, you know, uh, it, it was just I, it's just something that was just in my blood. It's always in my blood of being the theater. And, you know, to me, uh, metal is so theatrical anyway, you know, in its presentation, everything else, whether it's, you know, you're just doing pyrotechnics or whatever, but that we can bring all that in. Plus 
we can do the acting and the drama and we can bring in outside people and create these little stories, which is kind of what we did. So yeah. uh, again, I've always loved drama and always still do. Cool. <laughs> I don't like working, living in drama, but I like. <laughs> <laughs> Again, about being the bass player, um, you know as well as I do that especially during the 80s time, the bass players were given a lot of stereotypes. Um, they really weren't musicians. They were just there for the look and, you know, all that type of thing. What has that experience been for you as a bass player um, who really is a musician and really is playing? Um, uh, you know, how, how do you get past... Um, where the, the actual guitarist was getting most of the attention with the uh, with the solos and the shredding and all of that. Um, where do you see your role as a bass player? Well, when I was putting the band together, you know, obviously the, the first thoughts came out, well, what am I going to do? Well, yeah, I'm not a shredder. You know, I didn't learn how to shred. It wasn't my, you know, my thing. And I didn't want to play a rhythm guitar in a heavy metal band because all you do is play the power chords and point out the audience, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've been playing bass on and off through the years since junior high school, you know, Neil Young band, stuff like that. So I said, well, I'm going to get back into playing bass again. So, you know, I, I went out and bought a, a little Ibanez Roadstar bass, I think it was, and just started listening to bass players. You know, of course, McCartney is phenomenal. And then Jimmy Bain from Dio's band. And I just kind of not copying their licks, but just listening to their tones and how they're feeling. And and I soon discovered I was I pretty much more of a natural bass player than anything else. I just fell in love with the instrument. Like, I, why, why did I start doing this a long time ago? So uh, as far as the, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the things that people say about bass players, I usually turn them around and make them about drummers. That's how my first line of defense, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, playing, playing bass is, is kind of like, it's kind of like uh, being the lineman in a football team. You've got to open up the holes for the quarterback to go through, for the you know the tight end to go through, whatever, and he gets all the glory. But if you weren't doing your job, ain't nothing going to happen. Yeah. And so you know, I learned a long time ago work, working with rhythm sections in my previous bands that you know if that rhythm section wasn't absolutely solid, then everything else he did didn't matter. You could put all the great fluff you wanted, but if that if that backbeat, if that foundation isn't there, you've got nothing. So. That's, you know, to me, it was be a real privilege to kind of find myself in that role of being the backbone of the band and giving it that low end drive and keeping the band together because otherwise it just falls over. Yeah. So, you know, just working with a drummer and, and getting that together is just it's it's wonderful. And I, you know, I've written songs around the bass like oh, Stand in the Light or uh, Trenches of Rock. You know, it, it was kind of a bass riff I came up with and then built the song around it. So um I, I, I'm a four string player. I've never gotten the fifth or sixth, five string, because first of all, my back wouldn't take it. Second of all, you know, the, the, B, the low B string just got in my way. So I just stayed with the four strings. I think good enough for James Jamerson, good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and I just, I just love it. You know, I, I feel, like I say, I feel like I'm more of a natural bass player and, and uh, I just have always enjoyed it and never seen it myself as a second fiddle player to, to Paul or David or anybody else that comes in, you know, to me, I'm supporting them and making, you know, I want to make them shine anyway. You know, that's my part of my job. Yeah. Well, and, and I think again, serious, obviously serious musicians understand that, but I think also the serious music lover uh, really does appreciate 
whatever's going on in a band, whether you know they're, they're, you've got keyboards, where you where you got horns, you got you know strings, or wh- whatever you've got. Uh, I think the serious yeah. music lover really appreciates that and, and notices that. Uh, I want to take us off of the music per se. We're certainly going to come back to the music, um, but you also do do other stuff besides music. You you pastor. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, back when I was, uh, we were still touring, and I got a call from uh, this ministry in England called Meltdown, and they wanted me to come over and, and present, you know, the gospel and and uh, do a thing on uh, the the occult and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, man! So, I you know, I had never I never really taught before, so I got in the back of the RV as we're traveling down. I started putting some stuff together, and when I got over to England, um, I just kind of fell in love with that point. And as as I was uh, giving this one sermon, uh, the, I really felt the Lord impressing my heart that this is what we're, this is where I want you to do. And I, you know, I did the Robert De Niro thing. You talking to me? You know what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I don't know. There's plenty of other guys out there, you know. Yeah. But I really felt, yeah. and so in that calling and at the Meltdown Ministries has really kind of changed my life. And so you know, I was able to baptize some guys, and I thought, man, this is great because one of the frustrations of being an evangelist, you know, in doing what we do. Is you know you do you set up you tear you down and you're gone and you know every there's no follow up with these kids and and that was always frustration so that was one of the things we always prayed as a band that God would find these guys get them into a good church and get them strong in the Lord and all that stuff and so when I came back from from that meltdown I just began praying you know oh God I, I didn't have any you know, I wasn't I didn't know what I was supposed to do other than, you know okay. I just started praying about it. And again, kind of like starting blood, the more I prayed about it, the more focused the vision became. And and uh, when uh, I retired the band back in 93, I think it was, uh, I was asked to come on as an elder at the uh, local Calvary Chapel here, which I did. And uh, as the years went by, um, I just got really focused. And I called uh, Wayne Taylor, who was our, my pastor, and says, Wayne, you know, where's there a need in this in this community? And well, he said, there's Renton, there's Redmond, and I think he named some other town. And so Meryl and I, we, my wife and I, we just started driving around these different communities and looking for buildings and all that. And lo and behold, when we got into Redmond, we really felt like, okay, it's Redmond. And we neither of us really liked Redmond, <laughs> to be honest with you. And so we drove around and, and we drove by this old school. And I thought, oh, they think that's where we're supposed to do the church. He goes, yeah, so do I. So we just came back and just laid it before the Lord. And long story short, that's exactly what happened. And I've been pastoring at Calvary Chapel Redmond for since late, like since '98, I think, something like that. It's been a long time. Wow, wow. Well, that's you know that's yeah. that's that's what I do. That's what that's my job. You know, that's my yeah. calling is to pastor, and I love doing it. You know. So everybody, everybody who heard that is now wondering, what is the music like at Michael Bloodgood's church that he pastors? <laughs> well. <laughs> I always, I always hate, I always disappoint people because people come to my church because, you know, of my name or not, uh, and they expect to see this church full of metalheads, kind of like the old sanctuaries used to be back in the Bob Beeman days. And, yeah, yeah. and yeah. nope, we've got, we've got a lady in my church who's 103. We've got little kids. So the music, you know, it gets a little bit heavier than probably most, <laughs> but not really, you know, I just, I, I have players that come into the church that I've been playing with for years. And so, uh, it, you know, we do everything from, you know, Matt Redmond stuff to, you know, you name it. You know, I've done uh, a number of original tunes I've written uh, over the years and stuff, too. So it's it's pretty it's pretty standard because you can't I never wanted I never, never in fact, you and Bob would agree with me. You know, you, if you do a, a church based on a pop sensation like metal or maybe it's the, the Backstreet Boys or whatever it is. The people grow up, they change, and it's gone. So you know, you, you, your your approach has to be more shotgun than thirty odd six when you're doing. <laughs> right, right. Although right right now, you know, because the uh, because of uh, COVID, and you know, I'm over here on the left coast, we're still we're still shut out. So we're still doing a Zoom church right now. So, oh wow! Uh, the music has kind of come to a screeching halt, unfortunately. Yeah. Which is just killing me. In fact, it's killing my finger because now all my acoustic guitar fingers are. Nice and soft now, so it hurts when I play. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, that's just uh, just what we do. We just do contemporary music, and and I, you know, I I jazz it up. That was the reason when I did my solo album, it was actually a work project because the guy I had brought in as a guitar player, he just goes, 
dude, you, you, you change all the arrangements. You, you know, you got, so let's, let's put it down on tape, you know, so we can give it out to people that come in and get me into the worship band. And that's where it started because I kind of changed all the, the melody, or not the melodies, but you know, the arrangements and stuff. So, yeah. uh, you know, I love, I love, uh, dinking around in that area. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love I love the idea of a, pa- a pastor who is in also is it, you're doing the pastor thing, you're doing the preaching thing, you're caring for a church, but you've also got the music side of things. And um, I, I don't know if you know the band uh, Grave Robber, but uh, the, the the lead singer of that, Wretched, uh, he, he pastors a church, and our very own Wild Man here, who who is a pastor uh, in in his state is a town there. Uh, he's also recording and, and is, is hopefully going to be coming out with some stuff maybe this next year. So I love that. And I think that's neat for people to see their pastors also indulging their own creative life and also doing ministry in other ways, just beyond the pulpit. I, I just think that's cool. Oh yeah. Because, you know, without my church backing me up, so to say, you know, and praying for me, I wouldn't be able to do it. And that was one of the things that uh, in fact, Blake, it was not together when I put the church together, but I just said, you know, if, they, if I ever put the band back together, it'd be have, uh, great to have a support of people that understood what I did and went out, you know, and 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 really backed up what I did. Because most of the people in my church, they don't have an idea of what Blood Good was. They'll figure it out, you know, a couple of months later, or, you know, did you hear, you know, but very few people, a handful of people are still there, there because of, of the band. So, and that's even better because no, nobody in my church is is impressed by what I do. You know, oh my gosh, what? You know, they just go, yeah, okay, we're, we're backing you up and stuff like that. So, I I love it. You know, without the church, you know, you ain't nothing. Who who else was I? I was thinking of, of course, you know, uh, uh, Glenn Kaiser was pastoring as well. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. There's been a there've been a few a handful of us out there trying to. I, both, I, I, think I, of, I think of uh, Jim Laverty from Baron Cross um, being involved in the sanctuary ministry there with Bob Beeman, yeah. also a bass player. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A great bass player, too, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, Jim, I, Jim and I are still good buddies. Good, good. Now, that, there's a, there's something I love to see. I'd love to see a Laverty Blood Good uh, album. You know, Jim Laverty, Michael Blood Good. A lot of bass on that record, wouldn't it? That'd be fun. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So, you know, the, the, the timing of this interview is really interesting because um, we got word here recently about Kevin, Kevin Whistler and passing away. So we certainly wanted to uh, give you our condolences Um and understanding that, and just wanted to to ask if you had any comments you wanted to make concerning that. Well, it's still pretty fresh for us, you know, uh, his passing. In fact, his memorial is this weekend, you know, so we haven't even gotten to that point yet. Uh, you know, Kevin, man, he just, he fought and fought and fought and fought, and I, I was, yeah, I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's hard to believe that he's not there. We're sending pictures to his widow for the memorial service. I'm looking at pictures of Kevin just, you know, recently, you know, and we're, we're always yucking it up and stuff like that. And just hard to believe that he's not around anymore. So uh, he was, he was so much funny. And of course he had such a legacy as a Christian. He loved the Lord. He was, he just, he exhumed Jesus everywhere he went. And he was just a pleasure to be around. And, 
And uh, like I said, we had so much fun, you know, laughing together and, and having, I don't know, it was just, uh, it's it's so fresh for me right now. You know, in some ways, I, I don't know, it's going to be weird doing the memorial service this weekend because, you know, he's not going to be there. I'm going to expect Kevin to be there, you know, come on, Kevin, knock it off, you know. Yeah. But he really, you know, he had really he had a huge fight with lymphoma, and it was stage four. And he before that, he was, you know, he he got, got diagnosed. He was going through all sorts of itching and hives, and it was just horrible. And we thought, you know, we really thought he was going to beat it. And then, you know, he gets COVID, and and then things started going, you know, really south at that point. And uh, uh, you know, our heart goes out to Elaine and all the kids and, and the whole thing there. But um, yeah, we, we love Kevin and, and uh, we just, you know, we want to, you know, support Elaine and everything we can do to help her out. And, and uh, in fact, uh, Trenches of Rock, when it comes, it's gonna, about ready to be streamed. It'll be dedicated to Kevin as well. So, mm. uh, yeah, so there you have it. That's, a, you know, I, again, it's so fresh for me. It's just kind of hard to grasp right now. Sure, sure. <laughs> The uh, trench is going to be streamed. Uh, just about everywhere, from what I understand. You know, it's not our movie, not us, but it's, it's my son's movie. So right. he fills me in when you know when something new happens. But he's got, he said he's just getting ready to sign a contract. So um, yeah, you know, streaming's been just uh, extremely uh, difficult to say the least. Again, I'm not involved in the process, but you know what he's gone through and all the contracts and all this stuff is pretty awful. But at least now it'll it'll be streaming. Uh, probably, I don't know if it's going to be this year or next year, but at least it'll now get get out there and, and get do the job it needs to do. Otherwise, you know, it's just hard copies, which is, you know, not everybody's going to go out and get a hard copy. I don't even know if anybody buys CDs anymore or DVDs, rather. I do, but <laughs> yeah. yes, there's yeah. a few of us left, but, you know, that, you know, right. the street, right. that's yeah. how you. So it, specific, if it's Netflix or Amazon, I'm, I'm not sure yet. You have to check okay. back with me on that one. Uh, but it's going to be streaming really, 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 really soon. And we we're talking about Trenches of Rock, the uh, the documentary uh, of Blood Good that uh, Wild Man had referenced earlier. That that's what we're talking about here. Uh, now you guys have got you're you're working on new material, right? I believe Les was talking about that uh, when we had him on the show uh, here recently. Uh, yeah. Where are you guys in in the the process, the recording, writing, and so forth there? Well, I've, you know, I've submitted four or five songs uh, and, you know, David uh, Zafiro and I are going to get together with us this week, in fact, maybe even tonight or tomorrow to go over them, to fine tune them, see if there's any that need to be rejected or refined and, and made better. So we are really, really in the early stages. We got a couple of them in the can, sort of. We gave them to a studio drummer in Nashville and he laid out the tracks and it sounded pretty cool, but they still need a lot of work. So, uh, you know, the direction, I mean, we're a metal band, so it's going to be metal. Uh, but, you know, we also do, you know, She's Gone and stuff like that. So uh, one of the one of the things that we tried to do way back in the day when we did Rock in a Hard Place, we didn't want to get pigeonholed into this is what these guys always do. So we brought in strings, we brought in keyboards, you know, we did, you know, we plus we were, it was still metal. So I feel like we can kind of get away with a lot of things. You know, All Stand Together, too, was a, it was a hard rock I don't know if it was really a metal record, so we we kind of we kind of mix it up because you know we we that's the kind of guys we are. We just like to not get pigeonholed and and uh, so we're gonna just uh, again it, it, to me it's way too early to tell what the album's gonna sound like or when it's gonna come out. You know we do we do Zoom meetings every Thursday. We all have um, Logic Pro 
keyboards or a, a software in our Apple computers. So we're just hammering stuff out. You know, I get an idea, I sing it in my phone, I go down and start to develop it. So uh, it's really kind of exciting because none of us really kind of know where this whole thing is going at this point, other than we, we've got to do another record. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, working with David Zafiro is such a great thing. He's such a great producer. He's a really, really good, close friend. And so it's fun to be working with him mano a mano like this, you know, even though he's in Nashville and I'm here in Seattle, uh, we, you know, we talk uh, once or twice a week at least. And so we're just, we're just developing, we're woodshedding this project right now. Yeah. And it is, is David playing on the album? Oh yeah. Excellent. Yeah. He's, yeah. In fact, he's probably coming in writing some music as well. You know, I think we've already co-written a song together. So, you know, he's kind of back in the band, so to speak. Cool. Right so it'll be fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll have Oz playing on the record and of course, Paul Jackson. Uh, we may, uh, Craig Church will probably be playing too. If you remember Craig, he was in the Rock Theater show. And uh, we had him uh, join us on stage for our last live show in Seattle. And we just kind of gelled again. And so, uh, you know, he's going to come out with us when we play in Ohio. And so we're going to, you know, we're just kind of fun bringing, bringing these guys in because we've known them for years. So there's yeah. a trust factor that's pretty awesome. That brings up a question I've wanted to ask for a while now, uh, now that I can, is uh, what was it like bringing Oz in as, as part of Blood Group um, for your last album, for uh, the, the Lamb of God video and all of that? What was it like bringing him? You know, it was, a, it was a, For all of us fans, we're looking, hey, Striper and Blood Good together. This is amazing. You know, <laughs> like, what was it like uh, having Oz in there? Well, the thing with Oz, speaking of Meltdown Ministry, a few years later, Oz and I were at Meltdown doing the seminar together, he came on as, you know, the guitar guy, you know, doing the, the, the shops. I came on as a teacher. And uh, we had one night where the by Marilyn and, and, and Oz and I were just sitting in the banister of this, you know, of, of Dave Williams' house. And we just talked and talked and talked and talked for hours. And it's at that point, I thought, you know, if I ever put the band back together, I'd love Oz to be a part of it. Because, you know, we just gelled in so many different ways. You know, it was just, it was just fun being with him. It was, it was effortless kind of a friendship even though we didn't really know each other that well. Uh, um, you know, of course, our first show was with Striper. So, you know, we had some history yeah. with him. But, um, yeah, so uh, after I got really sick and all that in 2007, I decided I was going to put the band back together. So the first thing I did was call the guys and say, hey, I'm thinking about putting the band back together. What do you think? And then I asked Paul, I says, Paul, I was thinking about bringing about Oz as a second guitar player. Are you good with that? And he says, oh, man, I'm totally good with that. That'd be awesome. So that's kind of where it all started. It was back in the meltdown ministry. And so, uh, you know, Oz made the call to Michael and say, Michael, what do you think? And Michael goes, hey, man, you know, why not? In fact, Striper wasn't really too active at that point either anyway. So we, we brought him in because, you know, Oz has never had, I think he has one writing song, writer's credit on Striper, on the Striper's huge catalog. He only has one writing credit. And I thought, well, I have to bring him on as a, you know, as a writer and see, see if anything goes anywhere. And of course, the last album we did, he co-wrote three songs. So he's got the, you know, so I gave him a little bit of a different outlet. And then, you know, so when we started playing live, we never had a, any kind of a conflict when Oz and Striper, uh, you know, we never, you know, we never seemed to be playing at the same time. So it's worked out pretty good. Now, recently, you know, it hasn't worked out that well. Uh, of course, Oz is battling with his, his, uh, his brain cancer and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. we really got him in our prayers as well. So uh, anyway, it, it's been really fun. And we brought him into Dangerously Close. We just, we had a blast. He's, he's, a, he's a real natural studio guy anyway. 
he, I just remember him sitting, listening to Trenches of Rock, you know, and with his eyes shut, and he had never heard it before. And he goes, I think we need to bring some slide guitar. I go, slide guitar? What are we, a cowboy outfit, you know? <laughs> so he broke that, that pool up, you know, and during the chorus, and oh, it was perfect, you know? So he's he's got this, this, this mind is constantly twirling. So, yeah. uh, yeah. and he's already, yeah. uh, he's written a song with uh, Les, uh, uh, I think it's called Judas is Dead. It's really cool mm. too, so I'm pretty sure that'll make the record. Wow. So uh, we love to work with Oz whenever we can. You know, it's one of those things where obviously Stripers is priority, and uh, like he says, Stripers work, we're fun. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's a bumper that, sticker for you right there. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Back of our T-shirt, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we love working with Oz. He's such a good guy. He's just good. And he makes great pancakes too. <laughs> yeah, right. If you know Hans, you take pancakes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got. I got to tell you, I, and I know you were saying you don't know maybe kind of the trajectory of the album, or, or maybe even when it's coming out. For all of us fans, the sooner the, the better. We can't. I mean, every time when, when Les was giving us little little glimmers and little yeah, hints yeah. there, and then you're saying little things here. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, I, I wish this were out tomorrow. I would go oh, get know, this thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Hey, well, good. I'm glad guys are hungry for it, because so are we. Yeah. yeah. And that, that leads me to another thought here. Uh, quickly, um, we just had Greg Hayes from Gerda Records on. And um, it's interesting about the role that metal is taking. You know, like you, you see hashtags all over the place. Rock isn't dead. Rock isn't dead. You know, that type of thing. So like in the 80s, metal, 70s, actual 70s and 80s, uh, metal had its place. It was the big deal. It was the selling out the arenas, all of that. Um, where would you say metal's role is now? Well, like, I, I, you know, uh, Internet has changed a lot of things. I mean, had there been no Internet, if, you know, record, heavy metal is never going to go away. It just raises in, in strength and popularity. But, you know, metal fans are total metal fans. I, I, you know, if they discover your fourth album, they go back and buy your first three, you know, and they just love it and they stay loyal to you. I mean, we have fans in their 50s now, you know, it's just kind of it's kind of mind blowing. I remember just wow. And uh, now with the Internet, not only do we have the, the old fans, now we've got this whole new generation of new fans because, you know, if the music's good, if the message is good. They're going to just gravitate to it. It doesn't matter. Now, there was a time when, you know, people look at rock theater and say, oh, look at that hair. Look at those jeans. Oh, my gosh. Now everybody thinks it's cool, you know. <laughs> okay, whatever. You know, so you just, you know, uh, with this new generation. In fact, when we played uh, in Norway, I remember looking at that audience. And, you know, you had these young kids up front just into it. And then the, the older fans were a little bit further back, you know. But they were just as into it. So we have this, this cross-spectrum. You know, I mean, in the arena days, I don't know if they're going to come back. I mean, you know, think about it, there's never any radio support for metal. And yet, you know, Iron Maid just came through a year ago, you know, and they were just completely packed out, which just blows my mind because I love it because people just, you know, the heck with the system. We're going to do this any way we can. So, you know, with us, um, you know, we do everything from, uh, you know, festivals like old time festivals, you know, to brand new ones where, you know, we're, we're the older band perhaps, but, you know, you've got all the new bands coming in, which is what I really like to see. Uh, plus doing just our own solo shows as well. Like we're playing with White Cross in Ohio. You guys know that. So it's going to be, you know, the vintage bands, you know, but we're going to have a blast because, you know, we've known guys from White Cross forever and a day. Michael Fee and their drummer has filled in for us many times over the mm. last couple of years. And uh, um, so anyway, I, I don't know, what, what, what is this place? Who knows? Uh, Greg Hayes really helps keep things alive. He's, as you guys know, he's done a lot of remastering for us and mm -hmm. vinyl releases. That, you know, we would just never have the time or the money to to put into that. Right. So he does it, and you know, it's been really, really uh, a good good bonding the our two uh, companies, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, you're also you're you've got a lot of merch out with uh, ChristianBandShirts.com and mm -hmm. and uh, Anthony Gober. Uh, and we had Anthony on the show here a while back. We were talking about that. And, um, you know, I love what, what he's doing with his site. He's, he's got guys like you on there, um, some other classic bands, but he's also doing the merch for a lot of up and coming bands and kind of the same thing. 
yeah. band may not have time to get into all that, may not have the capacity to get into, want to do the merch, can't really get into to do that. And he's helping them do that. So I think there's some good support out there. Um, you know, certainly that's what we're trying to do uh, with the show is, uh, as we always say, you know, connecting fans with artists, artists with fans and everybody with Jesus, you know, so yeah, we're yeah. just, you know, everybody trying to support everybody in that. And, and, you know, and I think what you said about the loyalty of metal fans, it also goes, and we talked about this on the show a uh, while, man, you know, uh, there's something about those, the metal fans who are also Jesus followers. Um, they're, they're on both sides of it. They're wired for loyalty, yeah. right? Once, once they've, once they've discovered Jesus, they're just, they're wired for loyalty, loyal to the Lord. Uh, but then they're also just from their social and musical side, you know, they're, they're, they're wired to be loyal to their bands, you know? And so you bring that together and you get some really fiercely and passionately evangelistic people, uh, both evangelistic in the, the literal sense of the good news of Christ, uh, but also evangelistic about the music as well. So yeah. it, it, it's such a cool mixing, I think. Oh, it is. It's, it's very cool. You know, you hear from these guys that have been following you for gosh, 20, 30 years and, they're still touched. They're still following the Lord. You know, they, they still like your music. It's just kind of, it's kind of mind boggling, you know, pop music. You know, I remember my, my niece was into the new kids on the block, right? Everybody was her age. The next year, you know, she wanted their toilet paper, you know, their pins, everything. They, you know, the next year it's like you can buy her something. She goes, oh, new kids on the block. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it was just, oh, that was the, oh yeah. I, I remember those guys, you know, it's like, what, you know, <laughs> you're going to sell your soul for them. But, uh, you know, <laughs> With metal, you, you have none of that. It's just, it's just, it's just very, very cool. I just, I love it, you know. And I didn't have any idea that was the way it was until I got into it and experienced it myself. But uh, yeah. I love it, and I find I'm the same way. You know, I'm still collecting stuff from bands that you know. Oh wow, this is cool. Oh, this is a remaster. Oh wow, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I love all the Ronnie James Dio stuff. You know, I'm still collecting his DVDs and. You know, he had the voice of voices there. And, and of course, my my first copying bass player was Jimmy Bain, his original bass player. I just love yeah. the tones and stuff like that, you know. And and uh, so I've always got this this thing about, you know, Dio and all that just because of the history I had with his band, you know, getting into metal myself. So, yeah. Uh, well, and, and I'm just going to throw this out there, too. You, you, you mentioned Dio and immediately... I'm thinking about it, no way, Dio, but I'm thinking about his time in Rainbow, and I'm thinking about, yeah. you know, those those great songs, and I'm thinking, I don't know, for some reason, I'm thinking about Stargazer right now, and nobody has any problem with those bands singing songs that are really great story songs, and they're mystical, and otherworldly, nobody has any problem with that. And I'm going, then, then why not sing about, and you were talking before, you know, some of the great stories of the Old Testament, great stories of the New Testament, other stories of the faith, man. It totally fits this genre. This genre fits those stories. And, and, okay. and so if you've got no problem with Ronnie James Dio singing about wizards in Stargazer, then you should have no problem with Bloodgood singing the, the, the songs of the Christian faith. It, to, to me, it just makes perfect sense. Yeah. And that was one of the beauties of, of the, especially the early days with Striper and Bloodgood and Baron Cross, is that we had a lot of attention and media coming to us just because it was such a like, what? How can you do those two things together? You know, so we got a lot of that kind of attention at the beginning, which was really really fun because you're, you're you're getting all this evangelistic pros out there because you know you have a lot of non-saved kids, you know, non-believing yeah. kids coming to those shows, so that was pretty magical. And, uh, you know, I, yeah. in fact, when I was speaking to Ronnie James Dio, when I was putting the band together, I took out an ad because, you know, David and JT and I were ready to go. We needed to find a singer and finding a singer who was Christian that could do metal was next to impossible. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I put an ad in this local rocket magazine, which is local music rag we used to have up here, you know, needed needed Christian heavy metal singer, well grounded in the word, blah, blah, blah. And the people that used to come into the store, I was working at, again a guitar store. I wish I could have done a sitcom about it because you know the guys come in the cardigan sweaters and stuff like that. And I always go and put on Ronnie James Dio, We Rock. And I put, can you do that? You know. <laughs> Until finally, Les came in one day. I, can you do that? He goes, Yeah, I can do that. Well, you're, the first, you're the first guy. He said, you can, leave. you can do it, man. Yeah. And, 
So yeah, it was it's pretty it's pretty cool. But anyway, yeah, Dio and I go way back. <laughs> oh, that's way cool. Way I, cool. I am loose friends with Rudy Sarzo, his you know his bass player. So oh yeah. Also very committed Christian as well. <laughs> well, and so it's interesting. You mentioned Rudy Sarzo um, as as being a committed Christian, and uh, you may recall that for a time Rudy was the bass player in White Snake. Oh yeah, I saw. And him. and uh, of course you got Tommy Aldridge, who's in White Snake, who is a passionate Christian. Um, and so it's interesting to me, and we've talked again on the show to see Christians uh, who are in bands that really are not playing any kind of particularly Christian music. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, so it's interesting to see their role in those bands. Um, and we've never had a chance to talk with Tom, Tommy. Maybe someday we, we would, uh, or Rudy, I don't know. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if they are able to do anything evangelistic with some of their bandmates. Um, I, I don't know, but be, be curious to see that. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you're a barber and you get saved. You don't just start creating Christian hair. You know, you just, you, you're, right. you're a barber. And these guys, yeah. you know, their lights where they're shine. One of the reasons Les got saved is because, you know, he hired a Christian keyboard player. He was a keyboard player. who was a Christian. He wasn't a Christian keyboard player. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's to me, it's just awesome. I mean, I've heard rumors that Jim Keltner, who's played drums on every Beatles solo record. He's played, he was in the Traveling Wilburys. I understand he's a Christian too. I've heard wow. stories that he sits around, reads his Bible between takes. And so who knows what kind of impact, you know, he, again, I don't, I can't verify that it is or, or not true. But it's kind of a weird rumor because Jim Keltner isn't exactly somebody that's on everybody's minds and hearts, you know, yet to kind of be into the Beatles and all that, can't even know who he is. So yeah. I thought, well, that that's, that's really cool. And uh, that's where we, you know, that's where Christians need to be. You know, my, my, all three of my boys are professional ballet dancers. And how do you change the arts? You get involved in the arts or whatever job you have, yeah. you know? And so, you know, to me, that's just pretty, it's pretty cool, you know, and that's, you got to encourage it. Of course, there's a lot of battles to fight, but that's, that's why we're here, isn't it? <laughs> Continuing metal and your 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 role in it is making sure it stays alive, and we appreciate that. So, but it is now before I let you before we let you go tonight. I it is now time for the on the spot um, question, <laughs> man's on the spot segment. So here's the on the spot for Michael Bloodgood. So you're on the stage with your bass. You are you can build your own super band. Who do you choose outside of Blood Good members? Wow. Who would I choose? Christian or non-Christian? Does it make any difference? It makes no difference. Well, I'd probably put Paul McCartney on bass. I'd go over to guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Ringo on drums. So I'm definitely going to battle him on <laughs> There are so many. There are so many great players out there, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. It would just, it'd be hard for me to be in a band like that because I'd be sitting down wanting to ask him questions all the time. <laughs> but if I, was, if I was putting a band together. Yeah, I mean, I would. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul McCartney and Ringo aside, you know. Um, oh gosh, there's so many. I all, of course most of my real musical heroes are all bass players, so it's kind of hard. To, <laughs> you know, James Jamerson over here, Jimmy Bain over there, you know, Getty Lee over here. You know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that'd be that'd be a first. That'd be a first for sure. Yeah, yeah. the all bass band. <laughs> all bass band. <laughs> get a singer. Let's come in and sing. 
but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, gosh, the, you know, if it, it, it was a Christian band, you know, I, I gosh, you know, Tony is great and Phil Kiggy is great, and there's just so many good people. And the, and these you know, a lot of the guys I I like to play with are just guys that I know that are just great people, you know. <laughs> they, yeah. they, of course, yeah. they all got the chops as well, but uh, it was interesting. If you guys you guys have seen the Jesus Music movie, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And, uh, you know, just looking at all these players from Larry Norman to, you know, DC Talk to whoever, you know, who's ever happening now, it's, 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 it's really cool. You know, that would be a fun band to put together all these, put, you know, get DC, you know, not DC Talk, you know, Toby Mac in there and Amy Grant and just do the whole thing, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, that was uh, that was quite an interesting movie. But, um, in fact, we're in that movie. Did you know that? Yes. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, that was absolutely. Cool. Yeah, I was. I, yeah. I didn't need, you know, nobody asked me if we wanted to be in the movie. I just, my our sound man, Paul Doty, goes, "Hey, you're in the movie." I go, "What do you mean we're in the movie?" Yeah, your song SOS is on there. Oh, well, that's cool. So I went to watch the movie with my wife, and all of a sudden, yeah, we're actually on in the movie. You know, right after yeah. Sniper, we're the band from the crypt. I love that. Underneath yeah. The the table. Underneath the table is a, you know, and underneath the basement is a crypt. And guy opens it up, and SOS comes on. That was really funny. And, you know, I just like, whoa, or, you know, that's cool. But anyway, I'd like to, I'd love, love to get together with the, the director, the producer, and find out what the story was there, how we ended up in that movie. I don't know. But it was, it was cool <laughs> you never know what's going to come down the pike. Now, that's when you know you're really famous. You know, when somebody has to tell you that you're in a movie, that's when you know you're really famous. <laughs> yeah, really well, you know, <laughs> I'm my accountant to tell them, you know. <laughs> Wild man, hey man, what's wrong? Well, it's kind of hard to say. I, you, you know, I'm a Petra fan, right? Of course. Who doesn't know that? But, but what's wrong? Well, I think I'm going through withdrawal. Withdrawal? Yes. It, it's it's hard to explain, but I miss the days of um, Petra concerts, Petra CDs, Petra albums. I, I would just love to have those days back. You know, you can. What? Sure. I mean, even as we speak, Girder Records is having a sale on classic remastered Petra CDs and albums. What? Yeah. Dude, I'm looking at it right now on girdermusic.com. <laughs> what? Yeah. Dude, right here it says they're selling remastered Petra albums. Like, washes wider than... Oh, not of this world. Oh, never say die. Never say die. Oh, my goodness. Ah, back to the street and on fire. Ah, you, you, you've got to be kidding. You got to be kidding me. Man, they even have John Schlitt's new band, The Union of Sinners and Saints. What, 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 what was that? Push the button. Wait, 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 you you want me to to what? Push the buy button now. You know, I, I understand what you're saying, but but push the buy button now. Um, I, I'm I'm trying. Push I'm, it now. Push the buy button now. Now. Okay, okay, okay. Wild man, just calm down a bit. Calm down. How do you expect me to calm down? How in the world do you expect me to calm down? Buy your favorite Petra albums now, remastered, complete, with limited trading cards. Click the buy button now at girderrecords.com. Push the buy button now! It was an honor to interview Michael Bloodgood. I really appreciate his heart and especially the reason why he started in heavy metal in the first place. It was him assessing the need of having a positive message of Christ within this genre of music. All of us can learn a lesson from this. We should look for opportunities to be a positive difference instead of the ever-popular negative influence in our world today. We should be asking God, how can you use me the best? And he will be faithful to show us where that is. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we will see you next time. 
The Wild Man and Steve Show is now partnering with New Release Today. Find out more about them at newreleasetoday.com. And don't forget to check out our website, where you can also leave us a review at wildmanandsteve.com. Music